Okay. Um, so, in addition to that, I'm going to have regular office hours, which I will post. I haven't decided on what those are yet. It takes me a little while to kind of figure out how I want to arrange my schedule. Um, and I can also connect with you via Skype. So there's a lot of ways for you to connect with me if you're having difficulty with the material. And these apply both for campus-based and online students. All right. Let's take a look. When you log on to ANGEL, you'll see a list of the classes that you are enrolled in. This is CISS 216. Now, your screen is going to look different, of course, because you're enrolled in different classes than I teach. I hope you're not in all the classes that I'm teaching. That would probably make for a very long day for you. Uh, you click on this. And again, this will look a little different for you, given the fact that you are in the, enrolled in the class in the role of student, or I'm enrolled as an instructor. Let me point to you the main areas um, in Canvas where there is stuff. Um, there are announcements that I will make. Um, it's a good idea to check Canvas between classes, just in case something comes up. For example, if I found that I had a doctor's appointment coming up, I might post to say, hey, I'm not going to be in class such and such a date because I have a doctor's appointment or whatever. So check those uh, announcements. Um, I have uh, the syllabus, which we'll spend a, a little bit of time on. And probably most important um, is the module section. And the module section right now, only one of the weeks is enabled. So you won't see week two and so on. But in week one, you'll see there's, for every week, there'll be a to-do this week, which talks about what you should be focused on. There'll be any handouts that I have. For example, here's a fair use guideline handout, which we'll talk about. And then finally, there'll be a lab assignment of what you need to do for this week. So every week, there'll be a module that contains the stuff that you need to do for that week. Um, sometimes I get a little ahead in posting them. All right, and that way, if you're a little bit ahead, you can, you can um, stay on top of things. Um, there's a discussion forum if you have questions between classes and you think that um, other people will benefit from hearing uh, the question. You know, um, you can also send me email um, if you think it's a more, you know, individual-based question, you know. So, if the question is something like, gee, when is assignment one due, you might ask that in a discussion forum because there might be other people that have that question. If the question is, I'm having pro problems with my project, it's not looking the way that I expect it to, then that probably should be an email, right? Because that's dealing specifically with the situation that you're running into. You can view your grades, view the other people in the class, view attendance, and so on. But really, the main action is going to be on the syllabus and the module page. Uh, we'll come back to the module page in a minute here. The syllabus, again, I'm not going to spend time reading every line of it. But I do want to kind of hit it on an overview level. Um, up here is a list of ways to contact me. Um, I, I aim to make it easy for you to contact me. Um, that way, if you have questions, you can get them resolved. This is both for the campus base and the online classes. Um, ask questions as soon as you have them. I have some students that think sometimes, well, I want to figure it out by, them, by myself. And that's a valuable attitude to a degree, but students need to recognize when they're making progress on an issue versus when they're spinning their wheels. Right? And if you are having a hard time with something, but you feel that you're moving in the right direction and you think that you can figure it out by yourself, that's fine. But 
at a certain point recognize if you're not making any progress at all. And I'll give you an example. Um, I hear every semester students say, I've worked on this for some crazy number of hours, a weekly assignment. I've worked on this for 16 hours, and it's still not correct. Well, if I had an assignment that legitimately took 16 hours to do, I would be very angry at the professor, right? If it's taking you, you know, an extraordinary amount of time, then there's probably something that you're not understanding. So don't spin your wheels for that amount of time. You know, bring the questions to me and ask me. One thing I try to do, and as I've gotten more experience as a professor, I think I do a better job at this, is to give you enough information to try to allow you to figure it out by yourself. So in other words, I won't necessarily give you the answer to something, but it's sort of a give and take. I'll give you maybe a hint in the right direction. All right, as opposed to saying this is what you need to do, I'll tell you, well, look at this, that, and the other. All right? But by all means, this class is not meant to be some sort of tortuous exercise that takes all of your free time. All right? So if you're running into difficulties, by all means, ask the questions in class. And part of the reason that I list all these things are to show you that there's a lot of ways to get a hold of me. All right? During our lab time, during class, during other courses' lab times, you're welcome to sit in on their labs. During my office hours, you can arrange office hours and we can meet either in person or via Skype. All right? Email and so on. So there's a lot of ways to get a hold of me. I don't care which method you take, just do one of them. Don't sit there and not understand something and hope that you'll eventually be able to. to to bully your way through it and, and push your way through it. Now, uh, through here is a list of um, sort of the course description and the outcomes. This really is our focus. This is what we aim to do. And this should be more than just pretty words. This really is, you know, the reason that we're here. When you're done with this class, you should be able to do these things. So take some time to read through those. Instructor's approach. this bigger I just realized the first sentence says a lot in my mind this is your class all right um, this is a small class I mean in person there's maybe 10 or 12 of you it looks like um, so if you have a question and the rule of thumb always is is if you have a question there's a good chance that other students will have that same question especially when you consider um, that there are people that are watching the recording of this online. So if you have a question, by all means ask it. The absolute worst I'll do is I'll tell you, look, we should talk about this individually in lab. All right? In which case there's no harm, no shame. We'll just defer the discussion until the lab time. By all means, read through this. Here's a list of all the college policies or not all of them, but some of the relevant ones. Instructor policies. I am very flexible on lateness. Maybe I need to brush up on my writing skills because I wrote this section to indicate that I'm flexible as far as late assignments go, but a lot of people sort of took it the opposite way, that I'm very rigid on late assignments. So I guess I missed the boat trying to convey that information. All right. I know things come up. Many of you have other responsibilities outside of this. You know, um, and there's just stuff that affects us all, illnesses, you know, family issues, uh, and, and so on. It's not the end of the world if you're late on an assignment, all right? It is, however, a warning sign if you are habitually late on assignments. So, Family member is ill and you're not able to turn something in on a particular day and you turn it in the next day or even the following day. In the grand scheme of things, that makes no difference at all to me and I won't penalize you for it. Um, what's good, though, is to keep me in the loop. Just let me know. And you don't have to divulge anything personal and you know, give me the reason for it in detail. Just say I'm dealing with a family issue. Would it be okay if I turn it in on Wednesday instead of Monday? And I guarantee that I will, in nearly all cases, say, yeah, that's fine. You know, thanks for letting me know. 
So if that happens a few times per semester, no big deal. A couple things to keep in mind, though. If that happens habitually, that's a sign that something needs to change. Either you need to figure out a way to spend more time in the class, um, working on the class material, or you need to ask me more questions, or I need to explain something to you in a different manner, or whatever. So a few late assignments, no big deal. Habitually late assignments, that's a warning sign. Because no matter how flexible I am, there's a point, sometime in May, that's the cutoff that I have to have the grades in. And if you're still working on week eight's assignment coming in May, there's no way you're going to be able to get through everything um, for the semester. So um, just keep me in the loop. You don't have to tell me anything personal. Um, just keep me in the loop if you're, and by all means, ask questions if you're having difficulties. All right, the homework. Homework assignments will be a total of 65 points, and there'll be a project, which is a total of 35 points, which is divided up into two parts, the design, then the actual finished product, project. Here's a list of the topics that we're going to cover, as long, as long with the date due, uh, the, the due dates on different things. Typically what happens is I'll assign something one week and it will be due Monday of the following week. That actually should say Tuesday of the following week. All right. Um, so, in other words, this week I'm assigning lab one. It will be due a week from today. So, the labs are always due the week after I assign them. So, nothing is due this week. All right. The first lab will be due a week from today. And it's due on the Tuesday. Let me go make that change so I confuse less people. Things are due on the Tuesday of the following week. I'll make the change later. These are the approximate schedule for readings that we're going to cover um, uh, in the textbook. Of course, we're liable at any point to get a little ahead or a little behind, but this is a good gauge to, for you to know that if you, we've covered such and such on one day, that the next topic will be the next thing in the book. All right. The project is due, the design part of the project is due Feb um, not February, I'm sorry, April 5th, and the final project is due May the 10th. I don't know if all these assignments are just showing because it's me, but the only assignment um, that's really relevant is um, Lab 1, which is due... I have Monday, January 25th, but it's actually due on Tuesday. I'll make all these changes. Um, but that's the only one you need to worry about now. These other ones are leftovers from last semester. Okay. Fair use handout is something I want you to read on your own. It relates to using materials from other websites on your web pages. So, for example, for an assignment, you might do a web page about the Cleveland Browns. I don't know. I don't know why, but you might. All right. Um, now you can't go to their practice field and take pictures of them or, or whatever. Um, so you might go to the Cleveland Browns website and find pictures um, on there and want to use those in your project. Because, we're stu because you're students, you're legally allowed to do that. All right? There's different copyright laws that govern students and then that, govern, that govern people who are not working in an educational context. So if you were, you, if you were, if you were starting a sporting goods store, you couldn't just go to the Browns website and 
you know, and use one of the photos of the Cleveland Browns on your website. That would be copyright infringement. All right? Even if you were a fan of the Browns and not a student and you want to make a fan page, strictly speaking, you would not be allowed to take a picture from there. Now, would they prosecute? That's another question. But strictly speaking, that would be uh, an example of copyright infringement. However, given that you're students, you're allowed to take things, material. It's, and it's almost like if you're writing a term paper, you put quotes in from a source. As long as you know, it's a legal, reliable source, and you give a citation of where you got it from, you're allowed to do that. So in our case, the citation doesn't need to be anything big or official. You just say, I got the, I got the pictures for this assignment from the Cleveland Browns website. And that's all you need to do. And if you do that, and don't take too many, then you're legal. These guidelines simply uh, describe in detail what you're allowed to take and, 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 and what you're not allowed to take. Now some of these are more re most relevant for uh, this class, some of them are relevant for other classes. For example, photos are most relevant for this class because you know, we don't do a lot with other kinds of multimedia in this class. So no more than five by an artist. And to keep things simple, I would say that means don't take more than five photos from a website. And that should be sufficient for you to um, get your project. All right. You will also see a module for the semester project, which we are not going to cover today, but you should read through the documents in that, uh, because within the first two or three weeks, we will discuss it. Because the semester goes by quickly. All right, It really does. It's 16 weeks, and that seems like a lot. And in some respects, it is a lot, but it goes by quickly. So. Um, Read up on what you need to do um, so that you're ready to jump on it when we're in a position to um, cover it in more detail. Your first assignment, I'll talk about at the end of class today, but you'll create a page. Well, we'll talk about it um, at the end of class today. All right. Web pages, websites. What are some things that you can find on web pages or websites? What's some of the content that you can find on web pages or websites? Okay, contact information. And what might that be? Okay, email addresses. And Usually, it's best that if you click on the email address, that it will take you right to your email. So that's a special kind of link. All right. Um, with mobile devices, even, it's that way with phone numbers a lot of times. That if you, click on, if you visit a web page on your phone and you click on the phone number, it will it'll dial it up for you. So let's talk about those for a minute. All right. In other words, on a web page you might see this. You might see something that looks like this. Email address at lorrainebcc.edu. And my Zero three six six four seven nine six. That's my office phone, by the way, not my home phone. All right. Now we have words, words, words. These are three different pieces of content. Yet they're different, right? They're different. This is simply 
two words, two parts of my name. These are just letters that appear on the screen and are displayed. These are also letters that appear on my screen, but they're different. They're different because when you click on it, it opens up your email. And you can put in a subject and type in your message and click send. This is different because, well, depending on whether you're viewing it on a desktop browser or on a mobile phone, let's say you're viewing it on a mobile phone, if I press that link, it'll open up my phone and dial that number. Web pages are viewed within a web browser. All right. Can anyone give a couple examples of, of web browsers that are commonly used? Google Chrome is one that's commonly used. What are some other ones? Pardon me? Microsoft Edge. Oh, Microsoft Edge. Wow, I'm out of the loop on Microsoft stuff. I, uh, I'm, I'm thinking old Internet Explorer, but they've changed it, huh? All right. Safari, Safari for Mac people. Firefox, uh, Opera. There's a whole bunch of, of them. And browsers are simply programs that allow you to view web pages. But browsers are smart because browsers know that all the text on the page doesn't mean the same thing. In other words, if I were to view this in a web, the browser is smart enough not to treat these three pieces of content the same way. One is simply words. One, if I click on, it opens up the email client. One, if I click on, if I'm on a mobile phone, it opens up my phone dialer. How does the browser know that this is just words, this is an email address, this is a phone number? How does the browser know that? I mean, alternatively, I could do this. I could make it so that if you clicked on my name, it opened up the email browser, oh, email client. And if I clicked on those words, it would open up the phone. How does the browser know that? I, I, I know what you're thinking. It's like, well, that's what we're in class to find out, right? You know? How does the browser know that? Okay. It knows that through, um, I'll paraphrase your answer. It knows that through some sort of code. It's coded in the web page an indication of what these different things mean. All right. How is it coded? Well, it's coded via a language that is called HTML. HTML is a language that we use to code web pages. That is, HTML is a language that we use to tell the browser what the different pieces of our page mean. All right. What do the letters HTML stand for? Does anyone know? It would be a good one to know if you're going to be on Jeopardy. Yes. Hypertext markup language. All right. <clears throat> Any sci fi fans here? I, I say I almost find it hard to believe that I'm teaching a course in web development and there's not a single sci fi fan in here. I mean, every semester there's always a few. What when they talk about like hyperspace? What are they talking about? Like Scotty, no, I was going to say Scotty says to Kirk, but it would be the other way around. Kirk says to Scotty, Scotty, take us to hyperspace. What is he referring to? What, what does that mean? It means fast. All right. It's somehow, if, or let's, let's give a different example. If you say someone is hyperactive, what does that mean? Someone's hyperactive, are they more active than usual or less active than usual? They're more active. Generally speaking, hyper means more than. So hyperspace really means it's more than regular space. We're going, you know, we're starting off here and we're ending up on the other side of the galaxy like that. 
So we're doing something more than just traveling through regular space. You know, we're going really fast, blah, 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 whatever. All right. Hypertext is like that. In other words, it's saying it's more than text. All right, what is text? Text is just words. So we look at, let's say that this was a web page. Pick something out of this. Let's say that this is a web page. Can't really read it, but that's okay. Kind of boring, right? All right. This is just plain text. What do I mean by plain text? It's not hypertext. All right. It's just normal text. It's words. Word, 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 all the way down through the end. All right. So that's plain text. What is hypertext? Well, hypertext is more than regular text. So what's examples of something that's more than regular text? Well, the fact that we can have links. That's a big example of something that's more than text. In other words, in plain text, if they want to refer to something on another page, they might have something on the bottom that says, see page 67. All right? If this were a web page, there could actually be a link that says, jump to page 67. And if you click on it, you go to there directly. All right? That's a big deal. And it's hard to imagine how revolutionary that idea was when it was developed. Right? Back in the old days, I mean, it was the, the web was developed for like scientific papers. Uh, Tim uh, Berners-Lee, um, working at the nuclear thing in uh, Europe, CERN, thought it was great that if he had a paper that he was reading about some scientific topic, and it said, it had like a footnote that said, you know, this section comes from this article. If he was curious, he thought, gee, instead of like going to the library and finding the magazine or the journal that that article was in, wouldn't it be great if I could just click on it and be taken to that. And that was a revolutionary idea. It's like jumping across from one galaxy to another, jumping from one paper to another. All right? So with hypertext, we have the ability to click on something and go to a totally different page. All right? How is this achieved? That's where the ML comes in. It's achieved via markup language. Now, what do I mean by markup language? And I apologize, whoever magazine this is. It's from 2014, so it's kind of old, so I hope it doesn't matter if I write on this. Let's pretend that this is your textbook for another class. And you're looking at this page, and your teacher is discussing this page. And your teacher says, this thing over here, is important. It's going to be on the test. In fact, it's going to be worth 20% of your midterm grade. Wow, that's pretty important. All right. What do many students do if a teacher says something like that? They mark up their textbook. They literally mark it up. They take, I think all I have is this pencil, but they take and they draw a box around it and put stars or highlight it a certain color. Now, there might be different markup for different things. So, for example, if you 
you going to do? Or well, you're going to mark that up too. Maybe you'll put a big X through it. And you've added markup to it to give some meaning. Well, that's exactly what web pages are. Web pages like this up to give some additional information about it. So that in turn, the web page knows how to interpret that. All right? Now, we might this with highlighters and pens or crayons or pencils or whatever, right? How do we mark up the text in a web page? We do the use of what are called 